intellectual property creation and management for emerging growth technology companies. Analyzing patent statistics for business decisions. This presentation is brought to you by the IP attorneys and professionals at Halsey Intellectual Property Lawyers through the Halsey Intellectual Property Technology and Invention Monitor website. Halsey Intellectual Property Lawyers. IP professionals for entrepreneurship's new golden age. This presentation is part of the Technology and Invention Monitor website's Legal and Business Issues and Instructions resource. Intellectual property creation and management for emerging growth technology companies. Analyzing patent statistics for business decisions. Let's begin the presentation. One of the areas of my background has to do with economics and econometrics and essentially uh, using statistical information for the purpose of gathering information from raw statistics alone. And a branch of statistics is known as information sciences and, the, and, and that has to do with gleaning from the statistical bibliographic data information that relates to a particular area of concern. And so that's what we're going to talk about at this point, and that is some of the work that the Chi Research Organization has done to extract from data that's available on the face of patents that actually goes to a higher level of sophistication and I think a higher level of interest not the, the least of which is the correlation between this information that appears on patents and, and the use of the information that appears on patents to make a connection in terms of science and in terms of, of the development pace of a particular industry and also in the area of linking patent information to financial performance or what goes on on Wall Street, if you will, two particular areas of technology. And in the last module, we'll uh, review some of the other areas of internet or online IP databases. So patent statistics themselves are not inherently difficult to analyze. Uh, if you do a number of things, as you have to do with any area of technology, one is to properly normalize the data. If the underlying data are properly cleaned up and unified, in other words, making sure that you understand data that may not be of a similar nature in its first appearance and understanding the relationship between uh, different types of data. For example, patents that may come from a parent corporation on the one hand and a subsidiary corporation on the other hand actually if could and in, in many instances should be unified so that patents are viewed as coming from essentially the same source. There's the need to property, properly validate the indicators that relate to particular data. And then finally, efforts need to, make, uh, need to take place with regard to the normalization and the unification of, that are, are from the databases that are primarily used for searching and information retrieval, such as uh, the prime example is the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office database, but also the WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization database, and those types of databases, the purpose of which is to provide simply the extraction of the, the raw data. And so this normalization and the unification of data is an important part of being able to do some uh, higher level statistical or information science analysis and applying these types of, of disciplines into the patent literature. So normalization deals with the fact that patent properties vary widely across different technologies. For example, there's, there's a, a science linkage may exist between uh, zero to one auto mechanical technologies or five to 10 pharmaceutical technologies or 20 or higher uh, for genetic engineering, and we'll talk about what the science linkage is, but the point of the science linkage is to make sure that you understand the relationship between the patent literature that exists and the technology and science that is in a particular area. The understanding that the patent citation distributions are highly skewed and can be, for example, uh, there can be an unnatural or uh, subjective 
type of correlation between certain types of data and extracting from that data the, uh, the, the skewed character of that data for the purpose of determining important relationships from the statistical information can be very important. And then the realization further that the, inf the inventor productivity can be highly concentrated in about a few individuals and in understanding what that may mean to a particular area of endeavor. For example, in that area, I remember many years ago when I was a scientific and technical analyst for the Department of Defense, we knew that as far as laser technology was concerned from the former Soviet Union, that there were just a small handful of leaders. There was a Valery Basov, for example, uh, I think Vladimir Basov, who was a uh, scientist, a, a laser scientist in the Soviet Union. And he was a particular person who we would track because of his, in his public literature as to what he was doing because oftentimes those public literatures, uh, resources uh, such as university or technical publications would be indicative of an area of pursuit that may have some type of industry or uh, national significance. So another area that's important, of, of importance is the competitor assessment and understanding where a particular organization or, or company may be. This is, uh, again, from the Kai Research Organization that gives the example of Honda and particular areas of technology that are important to them and where they sit relative to other competitors. For example, uh, the areas that we've identified here are engine ignition, engine mechanical, suspension, steering, coach exterior, automotive equipment, transmission brakes, and coach interior. And across here is based on a, a, a one, a normalized one, where they are in relation to their competitors. So if a, in, in terms of their competitive assessment, they are stronger, such a, a, a graph would indicate that the bar would be going more to the right, whereas if they were weaker in a particular area based on either science leakage, a leakage or relating to the, um, the technology cycle time or other areas from which the patent analysis would give an indication of their uh, relative strength or weakness, if they were weaker, you'd see them go below this normalized one in terms of where they are concerning their, their competitors. And this citation analysis can be a tool once normalized and once the data is properly unified for the purpose of determining where a particular company is. Another area that's important here is that is called out in the analysis of the data is that there, with many organizations, universities, institutions, corporations, a few key inventors may drive an entire laboratory. Uh, the, semicon the Xerox semiconductor inventors from 1981 to 1987 are shown here where the number of patents, where they're cited as inventor or co-inventor uh, from zero to 18 uh, and across here are the numbers of the individuals and you'll see that for this individual there may be one or two individuals with 18 or more patents and it'll go down progressively. Look here though, there are only a few relative to the number of like 119 patents here where the inventor is cited but once, you'll see 16 patents here in this particular example where there are four or more patents cited. And then at the level of 12 to 18, very few individuals are uh, particularly cited in, a, in an area. So each, each one of these sticks represents one Xerox inventor and the height is the number of his or her patent in a particular seven year period. And this type of information will allow you, and incidentally, we, if you remember, we talked about the Derwent or the Delphion uh, website and this type of information is also available in a form called the snapshot form or one of the fields in the snapshot form that will allow you to do this type of analysis but also if you recall in that presentation we were able to not only do raw numbers but from those numbers create a series of hyperlinks or hypertext uh, links that would take us from a 
determination of a particular inventor or set of inventors to the patents that are available on the Delphion website and from the patents do all kinds of searches that relate to the particular area of development by virtue of the hypertext capabilities on the Delphion website. But still here the point being made that with the data and understanding the particular data of an organization or a field of inquiry or field of development, it's oftentimes the case that one or more uh, or, or, or a few individuals will be the, in fact the leaders for an entire area of enterprise or an entire area of development. So this process of data unification entails looking at company names and determining the need for unification or combination in determining the existence of patents, looking at inventor names, inventor and company locations, geographical regions, countries and such, uh, science reference unification, correlating science references such as papers to patents and providing information that relate the two because both are available on different types of sources uh, further example, the scientific data it would be available at the dialog uh, databases or um, uh, perhaps using the NERAC sources. We talked about that, or we'll talk about that shortly. And then the citation matching, especially in patents with external system priority and references that move out beyond the particular patents and understanding how these uh, pieces of data can be used for the purpose of getting more and more precise and more insightful information. H here's an example. The, co the company Aventis has about 29,000 patents. Unfortunately, about 1% have the name Aventis in the assignee field. So if you were to go to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office database and type in the field Aventis, fact is you'd only perhaps see uh, maybe 290 patents with that name. Understanding further what these relationships are with the different corporations, this unification of the data if you would require that at least in particular areas, if not within separate companies, you in, under, in understanding the patents that Aventus has at, at its disposal, you would need to know uh, the patents that uh, Richard Mer Richardson Merrill would have, Marion Labs, Phone, uh, Roan uh, Pulik, Rohrer, uh, different companies, all of which that would lead eventually to Aventus, but understanding further that not all these necessarily would go to Aventus. Some would go to Procter & Gamble, some would go to Selenese AG, some would go to Rodia, and understanding that uh, the corporate relationship between areas of technology and inventors and unifying those is a, an essential part of taking this statistical data and turning it into intelligence that can be used by a particular company or in analyzing a particular company. Next, there's the need for indicator validation. What does this mean? And well, because there's no absolute standard for quality in education or in science, validation of a particular indicator, particularly metric, must be done. And that includes comparing database indicators with external measures of quality or comparing the performance of companies with their patent quality and quality indicators. Uh, Kai Research, for example, provides a number of indicators that relate to the quality of a patent. And we're talking about some of those, but they provide others that can be used to determine the quality of a patent or the quality of a particular disclosure and relating that to a particular indicator for the purpose of validating that indicator is important. And by other comparative analyses uh, for patents such as non, a patent versus non-patent measures relating a patent document for example in many ways, many, many ways is similar to a technical paper or white paper but in about the same number of ways, for example, that it can be similar, it can be a very different document. And understanding the comparison between the scientific and technical disclosure that exists in a patent and the scientific and technical disclosure that exists in a white paper or professional journal publication and why certain pieces of information would be in one work versus another 
uh, can be very important in understanding the relevance of that particular piece of information in the patent document for the purpose of continuing this work in scientific patent analysis. So examples of validation studies uh, are that science intensive patent categories frequently cite to research papers. The research papers being the basis for some of the understanding and some of the uh, proving of the more scientifically esoteric aspects of a particular scientific patent disclosure. Uh, highly cited patents and clusters identify important discoveries. And so if a patent happens to cite a particularly highly cited patent, then that can be important for the purpose of at least, uh, at least in some ways, validating the technology disclosed in that particular patent because the patent itself is intended to build on the site, build on the technology and if the patent references a well-recognized, uh, historically significant or highly cited patent that it too uh, can be validated at least in, to some measure in its furthering of the science or technology. And then further, patents associated with various awards are far more highly cited than expected. Why? Because they get greater publicity. They get press. They are made part of a, corporate's, a corporation's website or institution's website. Oftentimes they can be the subject of, of litigation or they can be the, the, the patents that are the most important patents in defining a particular industry. And so these types of patents are frequently cited. And there has to be some measure of normalization of that information in order to determine its particular contribution in the area. And then further, patents making important contributions are more highly cited for the reasons that I've already given. Here's an example of what I mean. This graph shows patents uh, from the years 1960 through 1990 and provides you, if you look at the legend, it, the average number of citations, patent citations, over these period of time, ranging from zero to, say, four or five. And then historically significant patents are indicated by the triangles with the Hall of Fame patents, whether it's Inventor Hall of Fame or other type of recognition uh, hall of, uh, patents are listed with the X. And then finally, the pioneer patents, first in a particular area, the first laser patent, or, for example, the first uh, gallium arsenide patent that would be used for a gallium arsenide technology for use in a semiconductor device. And so with this chart, what you see here is the number of citations from, the, again, the Chi Research Database uh, over the years. And clearly, if this is the line of normal citation for a particular area of, of patent or patents generally, it can be said and noticed uh, from this chart that since 1960, pioneer patents were cited 391% more than expected. Expected would be this line. So your pioneer patents, these black diamonds, 391% over this period of time. The average Hall of Fame patent, these X's, are cited 365% more than expected. And then significantly, uh, historically significant patents are cited 173% more than expected. So we see this, this, this different result from these patents who, that have become uh, the part of the knowledge of a particular industry by either being a pioneer patent, being a Hall of Fame patent, or a historically significant patent, all of which credence is most of the time highly deserved by a particular patent. But these citations are important not only in the allowance of a particular patent, but also in the determination of the relevance of these patents, these, these types of patents to continuing development. Here's an example of, the, uh, of an Intel patent that is cited, this original patent by Intel uh, that was issued the, in 1996. Its number is 5546546. As you can see from this work, that, that a highly cited patent from Intel ciders include 
Compaq, IBM, AMD, NCR, uh, these, are, and these are patents that cite this particular Intel patent, and we also make the note here that 14 citing patents from Toshiba Sun National Semiconductors were removed from this, this, this for space considerations in this diagram, but the point being that here I have a, an Intel patent that has a total in this diagram of 62 citations, and it's just one patent, so clearly this patent is either a, a pioneering patent, is historically significant, or for some other reason really puts itself or is found as a patent of, of great significance in this particular endeavor. Another area of importance is the citation to a particular company by, by so many uh, patentees. Now why does this happen? It happens at least in one respect because of the sheer number of patents. If you look at the numbers of patents that, that are held over a period of time in a particular area, here these, this is a citation map from different country uh, companies like Toshiba, Texas Instruments. Uh, in these areas, in this particular semiconductor area of this example, you'll have a citation, the Chi Research can provide to you a citation that'll show the most cited and the second most cited companies for a particular company. So let's take the example of AMD. In the example of AMD, AMD's patents cite Intel patents a little over a thousand times but they cite IBM patents another 700 times in their patent databases. Compaq, for example, cites IBM 2,352 times. The second most is Hitachi. And so what, we see, what we're seeing here is these companies that cross-cite one another in their patents clearly, clearly. When we're talking about patent licensing, uh, patent infringement, with this amount of cross-citation, it's going to be highly unlikely that some type of infringement or cross-infringement uh, will not occur in the development areas. And so understanding where the citations are in the patents that are uh, submitted by the applicant in the information disclosure statement that's part of the patent process or cited by the examiner in the review of a particular patent application, the examination of a particular patent application. Understanding these relationships can provide you with meaningful information that determines where a particular company is or what the dependency, codependency, if you will, uh, between the two companies in a particular patent area. Further understanding of this, um, of this chart Clearly, in the original set, by virtue of that, uh, is meant that in an initial set of data, but these types of relationships have been determined. And then further, this, uh, the dotted is Lucent, which is a, a later development in this particular area because it is a, a company that by use of the data unification, by translating the data, of the parent company, the original parent company for Lucent. Uh, Lucent has been added to this, and we've seen that Motorola, for example, cites to Lucent 1,577 times and cites only a little bit more from Motorola to IBM for its patents. So clearly a lot of the technology that, Mo that Motorola has developed for uh, cellular communication, cell phone technology, comes from the Lucent, the original uh, Lucent uh, parent database, uh, the, pat the patent portfolio. Lucent was added, the name Lucent, the company Lucent, because it was a spinoff. So quality technology is valuable. We've talked about quality indicators. The, the Chi Research approach further includes the understanding that patent citation indicators can identify technologically strong companies which are undervalued by the market, here we're starting to get into some of the relationship between patent citation and financial performance of a company. A portfolio built on these undervalued companies, Chi Research has proven, and then there have been further studies, further securities 
uh, analyst studies relating this patent information, the quality of patent information to financial performance, that a portfolio built on these undervalued companies will far outform, outperform any standard index, such as the, stand, the, the S&P index or the, um, uh, any type of general company index. If we're able to glean from the patents that a particular company holds, the quality of those patent documents and what particular areas of technology that these patent documents protect, what other instrument is there that protects a company's ability to hold and maintain a market than the patent document. And if these instruments that protect the companies, the ability to hold a position in the marketplace are well drafted, in other words, they do what they're supposed to do, wouldn't it very frequently follow that that company can achieve better financial performance as a function of its being able to hold that market using the legally uh, allowed, legally pr promoted instruments for protecting that particular marketplace based on the innovation, research development, new product origination that the patent system, to, to which the patent system relates. And then further, the number of patents a company has is not significant in a particular relation uh, re uh, regression, rather. In other words, there's a normalization of the data that occurs that permits a regression analysis between the quality of a patent a set of patent data and the financial indicators, the financial performance that a company may have. Is it, it, it's the citation indicators themselves that count. So with patent analysis, there are a couple of there are a number of advantages that can be gleaned from the data that's already available just using advanced information sciences approaches such as those provided by the Chi Research Organization. Uh, one is that it's scalable and can be used for technologies with only a few patents as well as technologies with thousands of patents. It's unobtrusive. It's passive, if you will. It allows identification of key companies, labs, inventors. You don't have to, and nobody knows that you're searching and using that information. There don't have to be direct inquiries. It's passive, just like the sensing of a, the sensing of a submarine or the sensing of a ship can be passive. You're using the information that's already out there. It's just gleaning from that information uh, intelligence that's important. And further, it can be normalized to reveal company-specific information that's independent of the technology uh, or the industry or the country that, is, that would otherwise skew the data. So the patent analysis can look at things such as the rate of development of a particular area of technology or the linkage between patents and the science or the linkages between the, um, the, the, the company-specific information and the... Uh, the, the information, the, the more aggregated information relating to a particular uh, area of, uh, of endeavor or, or market position. It can be broad or it can be precisely focused. Here, making use of the primary and secondary classification system or, or here making use of the particular lead inventors in an, in, an, in an area. And remember in this process that there's the possibility and oftentimes the case that a lead inventor might move from one company to another company to another company. And so this type of precisely focused analysis can be useful. It also can be broad, such as understanding a general area of development, such as medical devices. Now, this information, it's all available. It's all available online. That raw data from the online text-based or primary and secondary classification-based types of searches is useful, but here the patent analysis takes us to a different level. And as the importance of intellectual property increases, so does the need for analyzing intellectual property, analyzing these metrics. If there's anything that's important now, I think the, and I, I maintain that with companies increasingly comp competing on the basis of technology, on the basis of global positions with regard to technology, as an understanding of intellectual property increases, 
more intelligent decisions can be made. So the most basic indicator, of course, is patent counts. Patent activity has been correlated to R&D spending. So the more you spend in R&D, the more likely it is that you're going to have an increased volume of patent, and act, patent activity. Uh, there are classification schemes to identify the technology industry uh, of a patent. Uh, not, 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 not only are there areas in terms of the primary and secondary classifications for data, but you can, to some degree, relate that information to the SS, SIC code, the Standard Industrial Classification Codes, and glean even more information. But clearly, the first stage of inquiry, the patent counts in a particular primary classification or secondary classification, can be important. And so this makes patent analysis a powerful tool for competitive intelligence. Uh, for example, to determine whether Intel or some other company is spending as much as its rivals in new developments. If you maintain that there's a relationship between patents applied for, patents issue, and R&D spending, this type of correlation will lead you to an indication of how much research and development is occurring in, w with regard to a particular company. Uh, you can determine whether its trends are in line with the rest of the industry, and you can determine exactly what Intel is developing and how it compares with AMD and other people in the semiconductor uh, the processor industry. And then, as I've mentioned, there, there are more advanced metrics. And while counts of patents are undeniable, a good measure for technological activity, in order to evaluate company, the company's R&D impact, there's the need to weight the patent counts with measures of quality. Is that word quality again? Such as citation impact, citation analysis, the science linkage, the technology cycle time, or the speed of development of a particular area, and then the number of countries in which a patent is published, the online databases that are available uh, from the patent offices around the world, also available uh, via the WIPO.net website, and the percentage that are maintained or lapsed. Uh, this requires more inquiry, it requires more understanding, but clearly it provides you with an understanding of where, the, uh, where a particular com company is or institution is, and it's using these more advanced metrics that can be important. So the basic idea for citation analysis is that if I invented a widget, I must cite all prior art that I'm building on, improving on. That's a requirement. If you know about it and it relates to the, and, and, and if a reasonable examiner, this is in, in the United States, it's called Rule 56 in the, in the patent, uh, the, it's in the patent statutes. And that requires that if a reasonable examiner would de determine that a particular reference would be uh, relevant to the allowance of a particular claim, then the patent applicant has the duty, the failure of which, if he fails to provide that information or dis and decides, for example, either neglects to when he has it in his knowledge or he tries to hide it from the patent office, that application, the resulting patent, will be invalid. And so there's a duty on the part of the patent applicant to make sure that this information is provided in the patent, pro in the patent application process. The, the net result is that new patents cite to older developments. The cited patent is receiving citations uh, or receiving forward citations. So it gets sites that go back to earlier patents, and the citing patent is referencing the citing patent or giving a, a backward citation, okay? And this is just a matter of terminology. So the cited patent is the patent that appears on the patent document. The citing patent is the patent that's doing that citing of the cited patent. And then finally, a patent that receives many forward citations is said to be highly cited in this, in this analysis. And so, uh, use the example of the Intel patent. That particular patent, if it's a, a historically significant patent or an award uh, uh, receiving patent or if it's a pioneer patent, those types of highly cited patents are ones that are important for this type of analysis. So does it work? Well, uh, the HP patent described a cheap 
this is an example of an HP patent which described a cheap disposable print head that made a desktop inkjet printer with laser printers, okay? Uh, so one of the things that HP Hewlett Packard has done uh, significantly is to patent and it's a whole family of patents that relate to the ink tech, inkjet technology. And that in many respects, probably the principal respects, is why it's very difficult it, the, why you're paying 30 and 40 dollars for that little plastic cartridge of ink that goes into your printer, your HP printer, is because that little box, that little plastic box that you buy, and why it costs 40 dollars is because there's IP wrapped all around that box and the use of the circuitry that relates the cartridge, that little box, to the integrated circuitry that's on the printer. And clearly there are competitors now, just recently I've seen Office Depot side by side provide a product that has a market price uh, similar, uh, uh, that is a substitute for the Hewlett Packard inkjet cartridge. But in order for them to be selling those cheaper those cheaper cartridges, they still have to pay to Hewlett Packard the license fees for the patents that protect that cartridge. And so uh, th th this is an important part of, uh, of this process. Now although inkjets have been developed fundamentally for years, uh, the patent was fundamental in making them popular. And then further, the impact of the innovation is reflected in 200 patent citations from Canon, Xerox, etc. In other words, it, clearly, Canon sells inkjet cartridges and so does Xerox. But in order for them to be able to do so, they have to recognize, as does HP, must recognize the patents of Canon, Xerox, and other people in the, in the business. And then further, key inventions like the particular HP patents spur numerous innovations in an attempt to capitalize on new capabilities or an attempt to build around the invention. So in validation studies, we'll use the example uh, for U.S. pharmaceutical companies, highly cited patents are associated with increases in sales and profits. It's, you know, there's hardly a year or three or four month period that goes by that you don't see something in the press about the effect of a, of a lapse or invalidation or expiration of a particular pharmaceutical patent adversely or positively directly affecting the share price of a particular, of a particular uh, pharmaceutical company. And patents associated with industry awards are highly cited. And here's an example, Kodak senior tech staff um, rate is highly cited, patents much higher in technical importance. Okay, well, internal patents, that's ensure the case. And then further, pioneering patents, Hall of Fame patents, and historically significant patents, as we said, can be cited three to six times higher, more highly than expected for patents in a particular area. And then validation studies further show that stocks of companies with strong citation indicators perform better than stocks of companies with weak citation indicators. And then finally, uh, a furthermore award that numerous studies have shown the power of, cit of citation, and we'll talk about some of those in the slides that follow. Um, Breachman and Mogi uh, and, and make reference to this, and this is also cited in a book that was published in 2002 by a, guy named, a fellow by the name of Bruce Berman, which is, um, I actually I think I make reference to it here. It's, a, it's about a 600 page book. Bruce is the editor. It's a fine book to understand the power of citation analysis and not only the work that Kai Research uh, Organization has done, but others have done for the purpose of gleaning from this patent work, this, these patent information resources, the relationship between patent holdings and financial performance. Uh, there's a discussion, as I mentioned, of other metrics derived from patents. Uh, again, in the From Ideas to Assets book, Investing Wisely in Intellectual Property by Bruce Berman, actually uh, issued and uh, published in 2001. And then we're going to talk about shortly here two other metrics that are worth discussing, such as the technology cycle time and the science linkage. 
uh, that Kai Research provides that are important, I think, to understand these more advanced uh, analytics that can be performed relative to individual patents. So let's talk a minute about the technology cycle time. The TCT for a set of patents is the median age of all of the prior art references on the front of a patent, on the patent page, the front of the patent itself. For example, if patent A, a, a particular patent is for, issued in 1995 and references two patents from 1992 and 1993, whereas Patent B is from 1994 and references three patents from 1990. Uh, then the cycle time for each for, for the pair is 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 four years, and that's just the way the number the math works out. Uh, thus, the TCT can be used to see if a company is building on five-year-old technology or ten-year-old technology. In other words, what's the age of the patents that are cited on the front of the patent that you're looking at? And if, by virtue of doing a just basic uh, median age or averaging of the, the data, you can determine the pace at which a, not only a patent, but you can aggregate that and determine a cycle time for a particular industry segment or classification group in a particular area. And note that the, the TCT varies from technology, such as a semiconductor TCT usually is about four years, whereas shipbuilding TCT may be 15 years or more. And there may be other mechanical or biological areas where a cycle time can be either greater or less. And then further, a company or region that has a TCT faster than its peers generally innovates more quickly. In other words, if the... TCT for a set of patents for A and D is shorter than that for Intel, using that example again, uh, you, can, you can glean from that the suggestion or the implication or the possible implication that the pace of research and development for A and D is greater than the pace of research and development for Intel. Not that these are ironclad, not that they're strict, but they certainly give you an indication of a path that an organization or company may be taking. The science, the science linkage. The science linkage is determined by identifying how many references from a patent are to scientific papers uh, as opposed to earlier patents. And this can be really important, particularly as it relates to pioneer patents, but in other areas are, are as well. Uh, incremental improvements will generally reference earlier patents and not scientific articles. The leading edge tendency can sometimes be uh, identified by way of a science linkage. And so the patent is more likely or references more papers, published papers, than it does issued patents. Then chances are, first of all, that the innovation may be of a more fundamental nature uh, as opposed to an incremental nature, and it could be that the uh, that that particular area is pioneering in the sense that it has put together or pulled together not other patents but observations in a particular area of scientific research that now have developed to the point where a product or a line of business and new market opportunity may exist by virtue of the, op the, 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 the integration and the observation of science being finally matured or an area of science matured to the point where it can be brought into the research and development for a particular product. And then further, the science linkage varies by technology, so the normalization that we've been talking about in this presentation is necessary, and we just need to determine where those areas of normalization are necessary. The, the experienced people at Chi Research and, organ or, and other organizations that can provide this type of analysis uh, can, can, can be important. And then finally, the, uh, the link to Wall Street, clearly R&D activity and strength is vital to the technology-based organization's success. Uh, where would IBM be if it weren't for its research and development? Where would many of the product development, where would Procter & Gamble be but for its active research and development? Measuring R&D output and quality 
can be done reasonably well by analyzing patents. This is why patent analysis works for competitive intelligence and in some instances for merger and acquisition targeting. So any company that has set itself out along a path of acquiring companies in a particular scientifically intensive or technology intensive area of industry would be doing itself a tremendous favor if in addition to market reports and the SAC documents that are available relating to a particular acquisition target, if it took the effort to look at domestic and international patent protection and from that information make a scientifically more valid, scientifically more sound decision as to the